Hey everybody, it's the Lady Bam, AKA Mary McDonald, and my incredible producer, Mina Sharp. And we're here for another episode of the Lady Bam podcast. This episode uh, was recorded, uh, we were recently on a trip to Washington, D.C., where we did many incredible things. The most incredible, I think, on some level, was our uh, the good fortune we had to sit down with Maria Marable Bunch. Maria is the Associate Director of Learning and Programs at the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian on the Mall. Um, Prior to joining NMAI, Maria was the Director of Education and Public Programs at the National Archives, and um, Maria actually developed their very first educational initiative. The whole, her whole idea was that the National Archives was a phenomenal um, agency for education in America, and she wanted to bring it out into the country. While she was there, her most notable achievement was a six-part series called National Conversations on Rights and Justice. And she took this all over the country to honor the 225th anniversary of the Bill of Rights. And then there was a conversation on women's rights and gender equality that she partnered when she was with the National Archives with the National Museum of American Indian in New York to present that event in the city. Throughout her amazing career, she started out as a visual artist. And somewhere in her education, she fell in love with museum. She has worked at the Philadelphia Art Museum, the Southwest Museum, the Pasadena California Children's Museum, all over the country. She has also had an amazingly successful and long, wonderful marriage to Lonnie Bunch, who is the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and they have beautiful children, grown children. Um, I would, I, you know, Lonnie and Maria are like the first couple of museums in this country. They have done more as a couple and professionals together to expand, change, and enrich our culture, its diversity, and what we have to honor and celebrate probably than any other couple in the field. So, you know, if we could put them, you know, in the White House, if we could put them, if we could put them everywhere, we'd be in really, really great shape. Anyway, without further ado, uh, Mina and I are really excited about this because she's an, an incredible lady and a great mo role model and um, really changed for me. I've always appreciated museums, but after meeting uh, Maria and listening to her career and her devotion, my feeling about what we have there on the mall and what the Smithsonian has done and the people who contribute to it and keep it alive, my feeling has deepened and um, it's a precious resource. And I hope after you all hear this, if you haven't been to DC and visited all of our extraordinary museums, I am sure that Maria's um, ideas, thoughts, and uh, conversation here on the Lady Bam podcast will inspire you to go. So without further chit-chat on my part, enjoy Maria. Maria, you started out in this world as a child. You discovered that you were an artist. How old were you when the word artist became personal? Do you remember? Uh, yes, uh, I was quite young. I was like, um, I would say probably about seven. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, when it became very clear that that's where my interests lie and possibly the direction that I would be going. And your parents obviously saw that because otherwise these things don't happen. Right. We don't understand ourselves mm -hmm. that way without that kind of guidance. Right. And so I can remember moments where my mother, um, when, with my homework, I would do the written part, but it was also an etch, a sketch or a drawing of some kind to accompany it. Oh, my goodness. And I had a couple of teachers that didn't quite like that. Mm. And mm. so my mother often would have to go to school and say, this is what you want. And then this is how she wants to present 
her knowledge. So your mother really advocated for you. Yes, uh -huh. she was a very strong advocate for us. Um, I'm the oldest of five uh, children in the family, mm -hmm. and uh, and so when I look back on it, what was unique about she and my father was they were able to really distinguish among us what these key interests were, and um, and so by the time. As I was going into middle school, between 6th and 7th grade, my mother said to me, it's time for you to have formal art lessons. Wow. So what mom says that? What mom <laughs> said at, at that age? At that age, Extraordinary. Yeah. And she had found uh, an art teacher in the community who gave lessons on Saturday mornings. Mm. And so I started taking lessons mm. and, um, and took lessons all the way through high school. Mm. And um, and then during my junior high school years, I kind of fluctuated back and forth on <laughs> yeah. different ideas. So for a while, I thought maybe medicine. And then I thought, well, maybe I can use my art and then go into uh, do art, medical illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, but then that sort of uh, feel was quickly moving into um, the use of... Um, the computer software right. so yeah. it was no longer just sort of hand renderings anymore but it right. was moving more into that direction and um and along with that i had a very strong science interest in uh astronomy i was mm. fascinated by flight by space exploration so you you have all these things going through your head <laughs> that's marvelous <laughs> so so you know so what do you do so um <laughs> Um, I had good, good, wonderful teachers uh, who kind of just kind of went with the flow with me, so not really trying to steer me one way or the other. Mm. But um, but when I did, uh, it was time for me to think about going to college, I would say my father probably had the most influence on my ultimately going to art school. Mm. So um, and he was the one that took me around to visit various art schools. I was living, we were living in Pennsylvania. We're in, in Pennsylvania. A little right? town called Pottstown, Pennsylvania. I know where it is. I, I'm a Pennsylvania girl. Okay, yeah. so it was just like west of Philadelphia. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, and so. Um, I was in King of Prussia during oh, well, the we same like years, I think. Almost. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so he took me to Philadelphia. I visited Temple. Um, and then there was the Philadelphia College of Art at the yeah. time. Um, I settled on going to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. um, that was, and what drew you to that school? Um, you know, I think it was the it? training. Mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. uh, it was um, very classical training, but they really stretched um, or encouraged the students to explore all the areas of fine arts, mm -hmm. even though you may have had a specific interest. And so I was exposed to sculpturing and mm -hmm. uh, to printmaking. Uh, although my love was with painting mm -hmm. and particularly using uh, pastels on mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. I had to think about paper. I like paper a lot. <laughs> and uh, and so I think that's really also attracted me to printmaking as well. Okay. Um, and But it was the training. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, being trained by the best and it was that sort of uh, a strong emphasis on anatomy and then um, the technical sides of um, creating work perspectives and, right you know so now when you say your father had um a great influence on where you went to school and going to an art school was it the training as well that he encouraged or did you know that, that you needed classical training and do you know not every artist knows that right yeah. i would say that um my father had a sense of where he thought i should be mm -hmm. um he, at the time, though, he did, in, several years later, he said he knew that the academy did not offer a degree at the right. time, but he felt there were there were connections with the Philadelphia College of Art, which is now known as University of the Arts, or Temple, or I could have even gone to University of Pennsylvania to fill in that gap and still it's come fair. out with a Fantastic. BFA. Yeah. Um, but um, but the the studies at the academy was really grounded in giving me a good solid background. And when did you understand? Um, I heard you mention somewhere you talked about the importance of living a life with purpose. Um, when did you understand that art was your connection to purpose, or was that an evolution, or did that sort of 
happened to you more when you discovered your love for history and museum work? Or, um, do you know? That came with time. Um, yeah. And and never really discovered that that's what I was doing until years later. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of when you start to look back on things. You say, oh, wow, I had a purpose. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and also, um, and that purpose came about with the people that I came in contact with oh, that's beautiful. or had touched me along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and then, again, harking back to my parents, um, they um, were not a college educa educated, mm -hmm. but they were worldly mm -hmm. in the sense that they were very much interested in what was going on. When they got the opportunity, we went places, yeah. we did things. That's beautiful. Um, and I often tell friends, I said, I'm convinced if I can trace back the, my mother and father's family heritage back to the continent of Africa, I yes. am sure they are descendants of a nomadic people. Oh, wonderful. Because they went everywhere. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> they took us everywhere. The tribe, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Pack up. So my oh father my worked for a die casting company in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. They closed the factory every August because they had to refurbish all the machinery. So my father and mother would plan a month-long camping excursion oh. for us. Oh, Across the country. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful, Maria. And uh, and staying at at all the at several of the national parks, state par parks, and this planning was started in January. So again, when I think back on it, you know the things that they did that really served us later in life. That's so great. my father would go to AAA. They were members of AAA. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Your place is awesome. It is. Yeah, I know. And so they would get maps, and then we would spend oh, the winter maps. months. Remember yeah, the maps, maps, the yeah. paper, mm -hmm. stretching them out over the dashboard. Right, yes. Right? Uh -huh. And so they would do the little trip ticks, and you know, uh, and um, so uh, so we were pretty much engaged into where we were going. And yeah. because my father helped with the Boy Scouts, he always borrowed the Boy Scouts camping equipment until oh, we well, eventually got our own. Yeah. yeah. But we traveled across the country, mm. uh, camping all the way. Uh, we would go up in through Canada. Um, a couple years, we traveled along the southern part of Canada. Um, and uh, so it was just amazing the places we got to see up close because of that. Um, but I look at that as kind of the, the kind of um, foundation yes. um, that really led me to the world of museums and learning. Yeah. I think deep down inside, my father probably would have had hoped that I would become um, a National Park Service ranger. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But didn't quite get Which there. Which would be wonderful. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. yeah. but in a way, by going to school in Philadelphia at the Academy, I had access to not only the other fine universities, but yeah. the, all the museums in the city. How beautiful. And uh, the Academy itself had a Museum of American Art. So when I was in the studios downstairs, needed mm -hmm. a little inspiration, I would run upstairs and go through mm -hmm. the galleries. I loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the Philadelphia Art Museum you could see because yeah. it was so big yeah. down the parkway. And, uh, and so after my second year, I decided, let me go see if I can get a summer job mm -hmm. uh, at the museum. Maybe there's something I can do in the city right. around the arts. And um, so it turned out at that time, when I went, they didn't have any pay position, but had a lot of uh, positions I could do in terms of internships. Yeah. So I thought, why not? And then when I found out that uh, by going to the University of the Arts, mm -hmm. that a lot of uh, I could have a couple of semesters of independent study. So I thought this would be perfect. That would lead towards my degree. So um, so I kind of did a combination of study yes. between the two. But at the Philadelphia Art Museum. Um, I was exposed to various levels of museum work. Mm -hmm. Everything from working with women committee groups to PR to education. Mm -hmm. And out of that experience is when I really was exposed to the, um, the power of exposing the public to the collection. That's where it happened. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. where it happened. Yeah. School groups, uh, uh, programs for adults, weekend activities for families. That's where it all... And what did it make you feel when you saw that? Like, did you sort of have... Uh, were you having an experience that felt different than that 
as seeing yourself as an artist, when you saw people being exposed to wonder, really, the wonder of our culture, right? is that what got into you? Was it the people's reaction? It was or? the people's reaction to the collection. Ugh. Whether it's two dimensional, three dimensional, it was it. It kind of opened up uh, their minds to wanting to know more, right? Because they had this linkage. It wasn't only just words yeah. on the page, but the thing was there. Yes, yes. Um, and so they could talk about it. Um, in some cases, they may have been able to touch it, but uh, but it is. They came to the museum because they wanted to see the real. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. And did you know, as you started to learn your love for museum and the connection to the people, did you, did you set your course to continue your education to that? Uh, yes. Uh, I finished my undergraduate degree yeah. um, with um, a minor in art history okay. and museum studies and, um, and um, a... Um, four-year uh, certificate of study from the Academy of Painting and Printmaking. Um, I had heard about some budding museum programs in mm -hmm. university levels. They were just... Just starting. Just right? starting yeah. up. Uh, and especially in education. Mm. But one of the phenomenal people that I met at the Philadelphia Art Museum, Carol Stapp, mm. um, she and her husband had moved to Washington, D.C., because her husband, Will Stapp, became a curator at the National Portrait Gallery, mm. the photography department. And Carol, um, I don't know how she and Marcella Brenner met each other, um, but Marcella Brenner was at George Washington University. She had just started a museum education program on the master's degree level. My goodness. And she purposely did it here because of the resources with the yes. Smithsonian. I mean, my goodness. Um, and so, having met Carol, having worked for her at the Philadelphia Art Museum, when she came here and got settled, a couple of months later, she called me up and she said, Maria, you need to come to DC. You need to come yeah. <laughs> and find out about this program, and I highly recommend you come to GW. Kismet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I came down. <laughs> You're I, like, okay, because I'm a nomad, right. and I'll go wherever I'll go I'm wherever. interested. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh. And, uh, and she was the one that really strongly encouraged me to consider this program for wow. graduate school. And, uh, and so, so that's, that was, okay. I would say, is my real s sort of uh, first study, yes. serious study, into museum education. Yes. And then the, from there is where I really learned about the power of museums mm. and, uh, mm. and, and the knowledge that people can gain from museums. Mm. And is that where you met Lani? <laughs> so you know about Lani. I know about <laughs> Lani. It's a really great part of the story. <laughs> Mina and I were just saying earlier, we wish you and Lani were our first couple mm. in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you could be. You kind of are. <laughs> And Will we you can talk about that a little? Okay. Um, Let me just say to our listeners that Maria is married to an amazing man. His name is Lonnie Bunch, and he is, among many things, the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, among his many other things. So did you meet in graduate school? Yes, we did. Oh, how <laughs> lovely. That's so exciting. Although he had finished graduate school already. Um, a little bit older than you. Uh, no, not, not really. Much. We're the same age. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You look great. <laughs> Actually, I am a little bit older than he is. Oh, and my goodness so, sakes. So when sometimes there's a tug of war about things, I can always pull out and say, you know, I am the oldest. Yes. So I get to make the decision. That's fantastic. I'm a few months younger than my husband, and I hate it. Because <laughs> yes. he gets to pull the oldest card, right. as well as the male card. I don't oh, like it. Oh, no. okay. So yeah, so I play that card periodically. But, uh, but anyway, part of my study at yes. GW is I had to do the student teaching my first semester. Mm -hmm. Second semester, I had to do an in, in depth internship at one of the museums. Mm -hmm. Now, if you remember earlier when I was talking about what got me interested in fine arts, yeah. and, and I, ended, I had many interests, and particularly the one in science around space yeah. and aviation. Yeah. Yeah. The Air and Space Museum had just opened two years prior to my, oh my coming goodness. to DC. 
And so I said, let me just take a little sidestep from the arts. It's always going to be there. Yeah. And let me try something a little different. So I went seeking an internship at the Air and Space Museum. I was going to ask that earlier <laughs> when you mentioned the mm -hmm. sky. You know? But in the meantime, um, Lonnie had finished graduate school and had an uh, was hired by the Air and Space Museum mm -hmm. because he did some of the early research on the um, um, Tuskegee Airmen. Oh, yeah. And so he was like the historian in the education department. Mm. So when I came on board as an intern, that's how we met. Oh, my we goodness. We met at the Air and Space Museum. You met at the Air and Space Museum, and you loved the sky. That's beautiful. <laughs> right, so. Gosh, this is, a, this is like one moment after another kismet. Your life is, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. You know, and so it wasn't like I was looking for anyone. No, just, we never are, are we? <laughs> no, we're not. I mean, some people are, but mostly not. No, I you think, know, right? I just had my mind on trying to get through this. <laughs> process so I can get on with my life but oh, gosh. but um but in a way so that's where we met that's and um beautiful so uh, it was just so funny to watch him because he thought he was going to show me the ways of the museum world and <laughs> Like, right, buddy. Ah, uh, that's so great. He had no idea. He had no idea. He had no idea what had just walked through the door. Right, right. The rest of his life. His partner in crime. Right, yeah. You know. oh so my it's like, no, I will teach you a few things about museums, but. Oh, yeah, that's so great. Yeah. Now, how long have you been married? It will be 39 years oh, this congratulations. year. Congratulations. Yes. Fantastic. It, yeah. Now, I, I'll share with you that I am married 35 years mm -hmm. to an actor. Mm -hmm. And so we met acting. Mm -hmm. And I will say that uh, then he became a professor at USC of acting. And he's done many things he's written. And I've maintained my career as an actress. But I will say that one of the things that we, as we get older, acknowledge more and more is that the... Um, Appreciation of the other person's work mm -hmm. has been one of the cornerstones of our relationship. I honestly cannot imagine at times getting through moments in my career that were crucial mm -hmm. without having a partner who got it. Right. And I wonder if you and Lonnie have that experience. I would say exactly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think at I think at times, but I'm just kind of learning as as we as the years go by that we're together, that um, he recently said he doesn't think that he would have done the things he had done or where he is today, because we did move around quite a bit, mm -hmm. if he didn't have a partner mm -hmm. who had the same enthusiasm and the spirit about what he wanted to do and was willing to go down those paths with him right. to get there. Right. Um, I can't say what kind of went off in my brain to say, let's, you know, this is what we're going to do. But when the opportunities came along and we talked about it, I'm like, well, it makes sense and we should do it. Yes, it might not have made sense to another human no. who didn't understand the beauty of all of this. Right, right. Yeah. right. But for us at that time and moment, and also knowing my husband, my husband really, um, he... He, he also likes to do things that is of purpose and meaning yes. and it's going to make a difference. Right. And when he's not doing that, he's not very happy. Yeah. <laughs> you and don't want him at home. No. no. <laughs> no. And so somehow I just knew after every big th thing in his life, yeah. it's like, oh, we got to find another project. I know. I know exactly what you're <laughs> you talking know, we, about. We need something else to do yes, here. Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes. But it was, but he always wasn't sure if I was going to take the leap with him, and mm. it was always shocking when I just said, "Sure, I think we have to do this." Oh, it's beautiful. Um, and now, did he come from a big family as well? No, just he and his brother. Just he and his brother. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting too. It's sort yeah. of you came from a group that just always went mm -hmm. with curiosity if you were curious that you were on your way right and so he lucked out didn't he <laughs> you know he what did. i mean <laughs> and Don't you he, and said. you lucked out as well <laughs> i did no definitely. he won't listen to this do <laughs> <laughs> we just won't tell him about it <laughs> okay. well it's really i mean from my point of view and from the uh the world's point of view uh you really are a cherished couple 
and and the work that you're both doing is just extraordinary. It's so inside, in my opinion. Um, it's right in the zeitgeist of what we need to be focusing on, particularly right now, mm -hmm. uh, given where we are. Right. Right? Right. And here's this couple uh, giving us these, as you call them, safe places to come in and engage in two different cultures, Native American, mm -hmm. uh, uh, African American, safe places to engage in the history, the truth of these Americans mm -hmm. at a time when these Americans are um, being sometimes uh, related to as uh, almost not Americans mm -hmm. or as not Americans. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm trying to be gentle. I don't mm -hmm. know why. <laughs> <laughs> but so the timing of your lives, I would say, is also of interest to me, is mm -hmm. that the two of you are here with these incredible places that you're offering uh, to Americans to come in and learn about themselves in what they might have grown up thinking was the other. Mm -hmm. I, I just find it astonishing. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you two ever feel the size of that, or is it just your work and here we are? Or do you feel ever, you know, like when you're lying in bed at night, does it mm -hmm. ever, do you ever talk about like, we're holding these potential places of safety and uh, inspiration at a time when things are not safe mm -hmm. and not inspiring mm -hmm. in Washington. Right. Do you ever get that? Like, do you ever know that you're doing that in the bigger sense? Um, it's moments like this that really says to us, yes, we need to be doing this, and <sighs> now is the time to do it. Right. Um, we've been doing things that has kind of put us on the path or prepared us for it. Yes. But um, but we always walk away from it or look back on it to say we needed to be there. We needed to do that. Isn't that wonderful? Um, yeah. And, um, and we, you know, we were fortunate enough to be able to be at that time and place yep. with those knowledge and skills to do that. Yeah. And... Um, and very fantastic. happy to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how did you, um, how was this presented to you, the uh, National American Indian Museum? I mean, how, how did that come to you? Was well, that a surprise um, or was it something you were leaning into? Or um, I had been exposed to Native American culture. Mm -hmm. um, at in your travels age. with and the I tribe. tribe. <laughs> yeah. And um, shortly after uh, Lonnie and I had married, mm -hmm. um, we he was offered the opportunity to come to California mm -hmm. uh, to help complete the building of the California African American Museum. Wonderful. It was the first state-funded African American mm -hmm. Museum. <clears throat> if you remember that time in 83, 84, a lot of money was coming to L.A. to get ready for the Olympics. I, I remember it only because I was living in Manhattan at the time. Mm -hmm. And I during the lead up to the Olympics, I flew out, stayed with my agent, and did a pilot season. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, wow, look at all Yeah, the city all was all It was decorated. just amazing. It was yeah. incredible. And, uh, and so when we were in California, we were there for about... Five, maybe six years. Mm. Uh, our daughters were born there. Mm. I had the opportunity to work for the Southwest Museum, oh, which was an anthropology museum of Native American history and culture. Fantastic. And so that was my first exposure, really up front, mm -hmm. up close exposure to Native American culture. Mm. And, uh, and got to know, um, work with some of the social agencies in the city of Los Angeles. Mm. Um, and so, um, so I kind of see that as one of the highlights of my career mm. is, is having to work at that museum and then mm. work directly with the various cultures and doing, I, w I did public programs for the mm -hmm. museum. So, um, so I would bring in artists, craftspeople, mm. and we would do all kinds of programs, everything from lectures to family day events. Mm. So, um, so I've always sort of kept that interest in the yeah. American culture, um, from there, went on to work in a range of museums, and I, 
again, feel like I, I had the opportunity to work in everything from general to children's museum, the history museums, national archives, the national archives. And so every step of the way, it just kind of a, a preparation for the next history, history, yes. history, mm -hmm. right? Right. That's so interesting. And it was also wonderful to be able to, um, to cross over with art history and history. Um, because you can't really tell one story without the other. No. Um, people try, <laughs> but you can't. Well, you see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the result is not good. It's not good. No. No. So, so. so that that's where I really... So it was in you already. Mm -hmm. And then... Had it, the chance it, to really... Um, did someone know that it was in you? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, did someone hear... Like, who said to you, would oh, you like he, to do this? this. Oh, yes. well, he, the, how I landed here yeah. was um, I enjoyed my work at the National Archives yeah. as well as at the U.S. Capitol Visitor Center, but I really missed that kind of cultural aspect of mm -hmm. it. It was very government, very political, um, like yeah. history. And so I wanted to come back to that environment. Right. And, um, and so I just happened to see where they were looking for someone to hire here to be head of their education you just happen program. to see it yes <laughs> I, oh my here goodness I, yeah, I would go to usa job just to see, see what was happening on, yeah, yeah you know is Tell there it. anything that would catch my eye um wow and i saw this position and then i vaguely remember seeing it before and it seemed like it came back again mm. so i thought mm, what's I'm going on over there it. i yeah. said you know i've i it's been several years since i've work directly with the Native community, but yes. I've had some experience. I do kind of keep up with what's going on. Yeah. So anyway, somebody just said apply for it. I didn't tell Lonnie at first because, <laughs> <laughs> because I also was concerned about could this be a conflict with the Smithsonian? You just never know how. Yeah. Although there are lots of couples in the Smithsonian that works for this. That's great. Yeah. So... So in a way, so and so I just say you didn't tell him. That's funny. How long did you keep it from him while you explored until it? Until I remember? got the phone call. They said we want to interview you. <laughs> and I'm like, interview me. I was like, oh, okay. This <laughs> I better tell him. <laughs> yeah, this is a different step now. You know, I got to kind of fess up that I applied yeah. for the job. Yeah. So and um, what did he say? He said, oh, well then. He goes, you should follow through and yeah. see what happens. Yeah. You know? And um, and so I applied for the job. They called me in for the interview, and I still was kind of, you know, we'll see what happens. I yes. wasn't ex investing too much emotion into it at the time. But mm. they called me back, and they ended up offering me the position. Goodness. And I thought, oh, my goodness. Um, <sighs> but, you know, Lonnie, again, we were, you know, he, we were very good with each other in terms of, well, let's put this in perspective. Yeah. <laughs> he goes... You have experience, you have knowledge, um, and uh, and you've proven yourself. And this is something that he felt that the director, Mr. Gover, needed and wanted at yes. the time. And so he said, there is a reason why, mm. which is basically what I would say to him. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Isn't that great? You know, like oh, just yeah. listening Love to the, the partnership mm -hmm. of, this, of this situation. So, um, so I, needless to say, I was very, very excited about it because, again, um, I saw it as um, probably the last major position I would take on before mm. I decide to retire, move on to other things. Yeah. Um, but uh, what they were trying to do and the direction that uh, Kevin Gover wanted to take the museum, particularly in terms of education. Yes. Um, I thought this is perfect. Yeah, you know, this is what I would like to do. It's so. incredible. It really is. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of your programs here. Mm -hmm. I know you have a big festival coming up. Yes, we do. We you have want to talk um, about that? They have an annual festival called Living Earth mm. um, that generally would take place every July. Mm. Uh, since I've come on board, um, there was a desire to um, move the date for the festival so that it's more in line with Earth Day. Great. And uh, and then every two years, the Smithsonian does a Smithsonian-wide um, Earth Optimism mm. Symposium over several days. Mm. And that also would take place right around Earth Day. Mm. So this year, um, when I came up, what I told the staff, it's going to be fast-moving. 
but um, we, we really need to get in sync with what's going on SI wide. Excellent. So we are able to do the Living Earth Festival. It's going to take place this weekend. Uh, we tweaked a little bit of the format okay. um, so that um, we have um, some panel discussions, we have mm -hmm. demonstrations going on, activities for kids. Um, the theme this year was farm to table mm. um, and looking at how um, indigenous knowledge can support or contributes to uh, many um, us as Americans are now starting to look at food sustainability and food impact on our health. That's right. Um, it seems to me, um, from what I read about what you're doing and, what, and the little bit that I know about the um, indigenous, particularly women mm -hmm. across the country, mm -hmm. uh, their response to two things, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems there's a great response right now to two elements. One is climate change, yes. mm -hmm. right? And the other is in also the ongoing um, problem of Native American, American Indians still trying to emerge from a hundred years of bad food mm -hmm. and improper diets to their particular metabolism. Mm -hmm. So is that part of what we'll hear about if we were to it? Attend the festival. Is it focused on uh, when you when you attend the festival? It's really going to be focused on how um, taking how traditional ways mm. of uh, cultivating, growing food, seed saving <coughs> contributes overall now right. to how people review food and how it's processed. Right. So what I'm trying to achieve with the Living Earth Festival this year yes. is my theme is Farm to Table. And what I want to do is highlight what is happening in the Native communities yes. uh, in ways that they are now looking at how, um, how they farm, uh, what uh, foods they're able to cultivate and bring back. Um, and they're looking at it um, in terms of health, Mm -hmm. um, how to educate the public, mm -hmm. and also, too, how it's impacting the food industry. Mm, wonderful. Uh, because I also want to show, too, that um, what is happening in Native communities um, is also, um, they see it as a business. Yes. You know, um, as well as uh, rethinking their diet. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I wanted to highlight that's in this particular fantastic. festival. And also, I think what you said really struck me because it's sort of if one attends this festival here at your museum, you, you begin to understand the impact of current Native Americans on our culture in ways that we don't even know oh, mm -hmm. they are helping sustain and improve life right, right. in this country. Mm -hmm. And that, that seems to be... Uh, really one of the, the greatest contributions mm -hmm. you could make mm -hmm. because most of America, I would say, does not understand the vibrancy of the Native American heritage in our lives. Like There are many things that you were talking about I've seen in some of the things you've written and that focus our consciousness on how much Native American culture is influencing us Every day, whether it's in images or, right. do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, this this is going to be a very exciting weekend. Yes, I'm I'm very excited about it. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about the NK three sixty degrees? Yes. Um, Did you create that? No, that was launched just a few months before, before you I came arrived. on. Yeah, and I think it, and it was in the making a couple years before, but it is a national education initiative. Right. Uh, by the museum. They launched a wonderful website about a year ago. Hmm. Um, and this initiative is targeting students and teachers um, as a way to try to transform teaching and learning about Native culture, hmm. whether it is culture, um, their history, the past, as well as contemporary right. Native American right. culture and lives. Um, very much lacking in... in um, the school's curriculum. Absolutely. And uh, the museum even went so far as to analyze 
textbook. Yes, has and to. even the textbooks or even um, does. I mean, they basically will mention Native American history usually be like uh, pre nineteen hundreds. Yeah. But uh, and even that was very sort of selective, or not really quite point true. of view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but nothing beyond that. Yeah. And so Native knowledge three hundred and sixty degrees is an initiative that's trying to now shift that mm. and start to work more closely with schools, with curriculum specialists, and through particularly teacher professional development. Now, how do you do that, then? Maria, how do you make the transition from the um, the sort of research and discovery and the beauty that you you're you're collecting here, you offer it to the culture, but how do you get the how does that linkage happen where curriculums in schools do, will change, where a textbook is a new textbook is written? Is that through policy? Is it how do you go from here? like someone coming here and going on a tour and saying, oh my goodness, to a new textbook that tells the better truth mm -hmm. about Native American history. Mm -hmm. Well, the approach that the museum is taking is yeah. um, Native Knowledge 360 degree, our little nickname for it is NK360, um, also draws from the Native community. So we work with communities very closely yes. to develop the 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 information that we have on the website, whether it be lesson plans, um, activity mm, plans. Um, so it's a website. It's a website. Goes directly to teachers right. if they choose. If they choose, yeah. Got it. And we have native voices. I mean, there are video clips, um, depending on the topic of the curriculum mm. um, uh, or the lesson plan we're offering. So they you can hear and see native voices as well as information that teachers can um, incorporate into that curriculum. That's fantastic. So um, I have staff that goes out uh, throughout the country um, mm. giving presentations, uh, meeting with state and local officials, uh, mm. talking about the program and, uh, and how they could work together, utilizing this information to help inform uh, or improve the curriculum and the way they're teaching it. And how has the response been? The response has been overwhelming. Oh, overwhelming. Isn't that exciting? Um, we get a lot of requests coming in, wanting us to come out and do programs for them to help with training. Um, um, and this is this all over the country, or in just in certain parts? Is there a demographic um, that's more responsive? It is most of the the initial mm -hmm. interest, and it's probably because we worked with many of the communities in the Midwest or the West. Yeah. Um, we are starting to have conversations with um, 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 Native communities along the Southeast and mm -hmm. Northeast. Um, so it's spreading. Yes. Um, of course, we wanted to be able to do more. But, um, but we have states like um, the state of Washington mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. who have changed who have incorporated legislation from the state level that this curriculum oh, be that's infused. fantastic. Um, we see things happening in Minnesota. Uh, we're getting requests from California, who now wants to rethink the mis the emission histories mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. they have often told in the curriculum, but now they want to correct that. That's so wonderful. They're looking to work with us to do that. Um, so, um, so we're getting. That's a, just, a great response to it. Very exciting. Yeah. And I read some somewhere that in, inclusive in your educational program and in what you're committed to is the reexamination of treaties in our history. Yeah. I found that just stunning. Mm -hmm. My experience, a little bit, my personal experience, there was one time when I was in South Dakota mm -hmm. and um, I was on the Rosebud reservation. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to sit in on a tribal council meeting discussing treaties. And I found it so fascinating and overwhelming in, in terms of m my ignorance as to the ongoing situation of treaties mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. The amount of learning and understanding of history it takes to be able to currently 
contemporarily interpret a treaty. Mm -hmm. And we, as Americans, most of us, I'm afraid, think treaties happened way back when and they were that thing and some of them got broken and some of them didn't. But what you're proposing is sort of exploring, talk about that a little bit. I was just stunned by the idea that we could really have children learning about Native American diplomats in history. And mm-hmm. is that, that is very exciting. Is there anything you want to say about that? Because mm-hmm. I'm finding that like just... Yeah, that yeah. is very much a part of the NK360. And, wow. Um, yes, and um, we have come up with um, what we call our essential understandings. Mm. And, wow. uh, and in those essential understandings, we do address civic ideas and practices. Oh, wonderful. Uh, where we then look at uh, the treaties. We have them on display in nation to nation, mm. and we, we alternate them. Mm. Um, and we talk about the meaning of these treaties, mm. and not only then, but now, mm. and what we need to know about them now. Oh, but uh, but really playing up the role of, as you said, diplomacy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we talk about the founding fathers. Well, let's not forget about yes. our native leaders. That's right. Yeah. And the role they played in that as well. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's just it's fantastic. Now, um, you also, in terms of women, Native mm-hmm. American women, mm-hmm. you hosted a symposium on the Red Dress Project. Can you talk about that? Because I, I'm also m- quite moved mm-hmm. by that project in general and mm-hmm. thrilled that you brought it here. Yes. Um, we were very excited about the, the red dress installation mm-hmm. um, that um, was created by Jamie Black, mm-hmm. uh, an artist from Canada. Canada. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, it was in line with our um, symposium we were doing during March called Saving Our Sisters. And it was looking at um, the number of missing uh, or murdered Native women and, uh, and what is and is not happening yes. uh, to prevent that. Right. Um, and, uh, and so we had a day-long symposium around the topic. Miss um, Black was here. She mm. did a performance. We had them hanging out along that river walk. Must have been beautiful it was to see. It was incredible. <gasps> Did you take a lot of pictures? Yes, of it? we took Did lots have? of pictures. Oh, good. And in our most recent um, magazine, um, Indian, we talk about we have a whole article section on, it? Section okay. on the Red Dress Project, uh, and with um, uh, Jamie Black talking about it uh, on our YouTube uh, channel. Oh, look at that! You will that... see her being interviewed, and she talks about. Um, Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. I've seen some of this, and uh, she says she's collected over probably close to 600 dresses yeah. that are get donated to her, and she's had them installed in all kinds of amazing settings mm-hmm. um, out in the forest, snow. Um, they were pretty. They, I was quite overwhelmed when I saw them mm. here. When you when you saw the public experience the red dresses here, mm-hmm. um, what did you observe? Do people did people really understand what Jamie's doing? I think Does it, it, did it go in? Do you know what I'm saying? Because that's the point, isn't right. it? Right. Uh, I I think it really kind of opened a lot of eyes and minds to what what about something they knew very little about. Yes. Um, and so it, it really introduced them to, hey, have you taken a look at this? Yeah. You know, this is a real issue. It is a very real issue. Mm-hmm. And, and I think what's beautiful about you bringing it here is that I think for many years, uh, people who have even been aware of this at all, that there is a inordinate amount of Native American women missing. Yes. Uh, and it, it's in, the numbers are growing. Mm-hmm. People, when this project first came out, kept saying, "Well, that's in Canada." No, it's all over it's our all country. Over. It's yes. all over our country. Mm-hmm. And and this idea that Native American women are being brutalized, they're stolen, and 
then many are found, unfortunately, gone, dead. Um, and the, what my understanding is, is that most of the criminals in relation to this phenomenon is are not Native American men. Yes. So we have to get inside this mm -hmm. because this is untenable. We cannot right. be a culture with this happening right. and ignore it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought it here. And I, and I really do see in that moment when I was reading about that and just talking to you about this, it sort of crystallized for me the power of museum and art mm -hmm. to go directly into a really difficult, painful mm -hmm. thing. And this isn't historical. This is happening now. No, so this isn't right. sort of a historical event that was horrible that happened to Native American women years ago. Mm -hmm. We're in the thick of it. We're in the thick of it right now. Um, on the day yeah. that Jamie was here and she did a performance outside among the dresses. Yeah. It was raining. It was kind of a slightly rainy day. Yeah. So there was a, a group of people outside that was actually following her. Mm. And she was doing um, her performance. Mm. But inside, um, I was inside. I had gone out and I came back inside. So wherever there was a window yeah. looking out towards Jamie and the red dresses, yeah. people were just drawn to it. Oh, that's fantastic. And I'm standing, even in the cafeteria, in the right. cafe, they were all up against the windows trying to see what was happening. Right. And I'm sitting there thinking, if we were on water, and this was the boat, the building, we would be Oh, it. my goodness. It's like everyone just moved. Oh, so that's towards so the powerful. powerful. Yeah. And so... And then the discussion be begins, and then the awareness grows, mm -hmm, and then the yeah. emotional commitment yes. to these women mm -hmm. and to, to their communities mm -hmm. that are just devastated yes. by this. That's fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, in, in relationship to this, um, is there a connection that will be made with this movement, this particular horrible thing that's happening to women, the timing of this with the Violence Against Women Act that will be coming up again for, I think, the Senate, right? The House passed it Pass to it. redo it right? because our president got rid of it. Yeah. Um, is there a connection there? Will there be a conscious connection to that part of uh, violence being perpetrated against women, do you think, because, because of awarenesses like the Red Dress Project? I would like to think. You would like to think, think that, yes. yes. And... Um, and I think we had some impact. I mean, yeah. the red dresses were not ignored. I mean, they got a lot of publicity. Great. Like people came to see them. Right. Um, they were it's right side there. It's right there. They're looking down. What are those red dresses over there? Yes. <laughs> at the yes. mall. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> red dresses at the mall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, that's beautiful. Yeah. So I... Um, you hope. I hope. Like many of us, I hope that the right thing is done. But I also hope, too, that with the red dress installation, mm -hmm. um, that they became more became more aware, aware. or decided to re-examine re what they already it. know. That's right. And um, do what it's right to do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. We, we do hope. I recently, we're doing, um, uh, I have a birthday coming up, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm an April girl, and every year my fans not every year, but for about the past 10 years, different fan groups of mine have done this lovely thing where they they uh, they do a birthday fundraiser in my name. Oh. And they ask me, where would, where would you like the money to go? Mm -hmm. So this year, the fundraiser is being done um, to support uh, Sintagluska University and the Rosebud, mm -hmm. but also to support the uh, the disaster relief on Pine Ridge mm -hmm. from the three horrific climate events that have occurred. And as I'm sure you know, Pine Ridge is unable to get FEMA support. So right now our government is just ignoring it. And I wonder, you're in, in this incredible position 
and you are bringing uh, awareness and education to Americans regarding the beauty and the contributions of Native American culture. What, what about that gap between the most amazing things that are happening and that you are helping support that hopefully someday will be integrated as part of us as opposed to, oh yes, and reparations will someday be made. But in the meantime, what a, how do you deal with the gap between the beauty of all of this and the fact that there are you know, people on Pine Ridge who still can't, have no home to go back to, and we can't get our government to treat them? I know it isn't your, your responsibility politically. You're not mm-hmm. over there. You're here. Mm-hmm. But I just wonder how you... Um, what do you do about that inside yourself when you know the reality of some of these things that are happening simultaneously to the beautiful things that are happening? Do you feel in your heart that it's just you keep doing what you're doing and you offer education and you offer the beauty of this culture and eventually that will help influence these horrible decisions that are being made well that's how i'm getting a little personal here but i'm so interested Mm -hmm. in your amazing position you clearly are a woman of great intelligence and you've devoted yourself and i have been so even just recently two days ago on the phone coincidentally do you know what i'm saying with Mm -hmm. chase iron eyes from lakota law about the situation, for example, there. Mm-hmm. And it so clearly seems to me to be our government it, intentionally ignoring a situation that requires aid in a Native American community. And I just wanted, like, when you know these things all at once, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Um, I see my role as to educate. Yes. And to try to bring to people... Uh, knowledge that they need to help to them to understand mm-hmm. not only our culture but understand also to um, what is happening yeah. and why it's happening. Right. So, um, so that's where I see my big role in this is to mm-hmm. take what we have here mm-hmm. and really help people to understand mm-hmm. um, why we are where we are now. Mm-hmm. And what we need to know to be able to move forward. Yes. Yeah. So you're talking about foundation building, really. Yes. You're talking about the fundamental change. Yes. Not, not political response to what has been historically a pattern. Right. That's wonderful. Yeah. And, um, and not only helping um, the non-Native community and public in terms of what is what are these cultures all about... Because also, too, they need to understand it's not one group. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Okay. Yeah. We're talking about many groups. Many groups. And they're and, so different and, and so, so interesting. Right. And, yeah. But what I've also learned, too, me, since I've been here, is that it's also very important, too, that we also continue to educate and help those various communities to understand themselves, understand too. Understand themselves. And to learn their own history. That's exactly, and and how do you? That's so right and true because mm-hmm. there is an isolation that occurs right in, in, inside this system that's never quite been repaired. Right, and and, go ahead. and you yes. see many of the native uh, communities now are even starting to revitalize their language. Yes, language loss has occurred. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's very exciting to see that. Yes, um, I was recently in March. Um, in Oklahoma okay. with staff doing a workshop for teachers. Mm. Um, the local, um, the basketball team, the Oklahoma Thunder, mm. uh, was sponsoring yeah. some teacher workshops right. um, coming from the museum. So in March, we had about 100 teachers attend mm. this particular workshop, and I would say probably about 50% of the teachers were Native themselves yes. and teaching yes. in Native schools. And that they is. kept saying, we need to know this. Yes, they do. That's right. So that we can be able to go back and then educate the children about their own culture. Yes. So so that's the role I see here is really focusing on making sure people understand 
Mm -hmm. um, what the Native cultures are all about, mm -hmm. know the truth, mm -hmm. and um, and then give and find ways to give them access to get to it. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Now, do you think that your um, in terms of the people who come to this museum, what is the percentage, do you know, of people who are actually Native American who have been here? Do you have any idea? Couldn't give you exact, precise numbers, but... Um, It'd be interesting to know, wouldn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Because you're right. I mean, what a beautiful thing it would be to get Native American children off some of the reservations, particularly in places like South Dakota, where they are the roughest and the poorest and the most struggling, and therefore the most isolated. Mm -hmm. And and with little identity, really, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful to get them all here? Mm -hmm. I mean, what an extraordinary thing that would be mm -hmm. for these children to begin to own their history mm -hmm. in a different way. Right. We do get, um, we have what we call our... Um, um, Native festival days. Mm. And so we do uh, invite, or we have for many years on an annual basis, have groups come, such as the Cherokee. Right. We have Cherokee Day festivals. We're going to have the Hawaii festival. Mm. So that's when we get a chance to bring in community members. Wonderful. Um, and then if there are um, community members that are living in the DC area, they come. Yes. Um, as well as the general public. And oftentimes with those uh, festival days, if there is a youth group in the community that they want to bring or send, we do get them here. That's fantastic. Yeah. Has, the, has your museum, either with you or before, ever sponsored a powwow? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think powwows are um, an extraordinary gathering. I've been to several, and mm -hmm. and I and I find um, the activity of that, the dance and song and the beauty of dress, is really phenomenally important, particularly to children. Yes, it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Well, let me see what else <laughs> I didn't touch on, and then I'm ask you if you. Um, yeah, here's one. What surprised you the most at this museum or this work uh, with the American Indian culture? What, what, is there anything that you just went, oh my goodness, I had no idea? Uh, or maybe even not that large, but something that... Uh, what I would really... I get very excited about is mm. the National Education Initiative, mm. Native Knowledge 360. That's great. It is something that is making a difference in how people learn about Native culture, and that it is, and that the director sees it as a very important component of the museum's mission. Mm. And knowing what has happened in the past, in my past work with Native communities, this to me is a phenomenal mm. um, project because we are trying to actually make changes yes. in the way the history and the culture is taught right. to everyone. So this isn't, you're saying, this isn't just something, NK360 degrees isn't something that is, is part of what you're doing and you love. This is actually sort of integrating itself as to the core mission. Right. Oh, I love that. Right. And I would love to see where someday yes. it is said that because of the work at the American Indian Museum mm. with their initiative, that not only did it change the way curriculum is structured and taught in the classroom about natives, but it brought about a more comprehensive way in which our children are educated, all children. Mm. So, um, so that I, I envision or hope that someday it just changes the way we educate our children in this country. It's so beautiful, Maria. That's everybody a big needs deal. to know about everyone and themselves. Everybody needs to know about everyone and themselves. And there is a very sad uh, and incredibly painful grief that we all carry about 
the foundation of this country and the indigenous population. Mm -hmm. No one has seemed to figure out how to solve that grief. There has been no reparation. What you're proposing, as I'm hearing it, is the potential for that very healing. Mm -hmm. That really gets to me. Yeah. My goodness sakes. Right. So wow. when I look at the materials and look at the work the staff is doing, and when I think about what the director, Kevin Gover, standing behind this and mm. really making sure that this happens, yeah, um, I just see if we can continue to do this and do this well, just the bigger impact it's going to have. That's wonderful. Yeah. And that's, that's my dream. That's your dream. That is a fantastic dream. And as long as you've got Lonnie on board, you should be cool. Right. <laughs> Between the two of you, we could, you could change our country. And, and, and you are changing it. Yeah. And I am also very excited and very happy to say that both of the directors, museum directors, yeah. do converse with each other quite a bit about how they can work together. Oh, that's stunning. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you would love to share with us? I'm I'm thrilled. M Mina, are you uh, satiated? <laughs> I mean, I always look to Mina and say, what else do we have here? This has just been, um, I, I can't wait to air this. I really can't because <laughs> I think our listeners are going to, first of all, they're going to be educated in ways that they don't even know what's coming. Mm -hmm. But you are very... Uh, you're very inspiring and you're very, like I said, in the zeitgeist of what needs to be happening. That no one is quite sure, or very few people are quite sure, how to get at. Mm -hmm. And you've brought this into a kind of a central focus with this amazing um, institution. Mm -hmm. And clearly your director is, is a champion. Yes, yes. And, um, and so whether you are here in Washington, D.C., yeah. Or in New York, yeah. Because we have our um, one of our first locations in New York, mm -hmm. um, in Lower Manhattan, mm -hmm. and then our Cultural Resource Center out in Suitland, Maryland. Oh my goodness! Um, you know, you walk in the door. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Well, thank you, Maria. It has been such a pleasure to speak with you, and I. It happened quickly, and you were open to it. So we've been very honored to be here today, and thank you so, so very well, much. Well, thank you for wanting to, to speak with me, and it's been great to just kind of talk about you know, the things that, this, that are happening here. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll come back. Like, okay. you call us. If, you, if something's going on here, mm -hmm. and you want us to be a part of your promotion, we're, we're like half microphone will travel. Okay. We jump on planes. <laughs> we do. We jump on planes. We go. Oh, okay. Because that's... That is what we're here to be a support mm -hmm. to primarily women, but men as well mm -hmm. in our culture who we feel are really changing things. It's yeah. not, uh, it's not what we think. Mm -hmm. It's happening elsewhere. Yeah. So, well, I do appreciate you doing what you're doing. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. I get to learn so much. That's, no, it's I, really I, selfish, actually. <laughs> it's quite, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Hey guys, this is Mina. Thank you all so much for listening. Mary and I so enjoyed visiting the National Museum of the American Indian, speaking to Maria, and finding out about all the incredible things that are happening at that institution, the programs, the education initiatives. It's really exciting. So we encourage you to go online, uh, find out more. If you're in D.C., please go visit the museum. There's so much to learn and take in from them, and we thank them and the staff of the Smithsonian for inviting us in and allowing us to spend an afternoon there because it was truly something special. We have lots of fun upcoming things happening. Nothing we can quite talk about yet, but stay tuned because the summer and fall is uh, going to be fun. There's a lot of amazing things happening, some amazing people we're hoping to speak to and some other stuff. So stay tuned, guys. We so appreciate your listening and your support. And we've got some fun stuff coming up. So we will talk to you soon. <laughs>